something comforting, but, you know, my voice. Let's go. If I'm not back at the home by nine, they declare me legally dead and collect my insurance. Thanksgiving, a time to gather with loved ones over a very American holiday that romanticizes history. You have taken the land which is rightfully ours. Years from now, my people will be forced to live in mobile homes, on reservations. Your people will wear cardigans and drink highballs. We will sell our bracelets by the roadsides. You will play golf and enjoy hot hors d'oeuvres. My people will have pain and degradation. Your people will have stick shifts. The gods of my tribe have spoken. They have said, do not trust the pilgrims. It's also one of those times of the year where people will reach out and provide meals or other resources for those less fortunate. Some of Edmonton's most vulnerable community members are heading into Thanksgiving long weekend with a little something to savor. The Hope Mission hosting its annual Thanksgiving banquet for nearly 500 people Friday evening in what some may consider to be a difficult time of year. There's uh, music, decorations, uh, special food, a whole turkey dinner, uh, stuffing, all the fixings that you might expect at a, at a home-cooked uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Providing some relief and a sense of community over the holidays. I come here every day because every year I come here because I have no family. So I enjoy coming here and talking to some of the chaplains and the people that I know that have been here that are so nice that it's helped me get back on my feet. That's where I'm at right now. Yeah, so we put this on every year. Um, it's our annual Thanksgiving. Um, we provide over 1,000 meals um, today to our friends and our neighbors in the community um, to really help them to see that they can be loved and served. It's Thanksgiving dinner on a massive scale. 1,600 pounds of turkey, 600 pounds of sweet potatoes, 500 pounds of cranberries, 300 pounds of green beans, and don't forget the 400 pounds of mashed potatoes. We're, we're going to add three quarts of heavy cream and a quart and a half of butter. And you can't make a meal like this in an ordinary space, which is why Levy Restaurants uses the huge industrial kitchen that normally cooks ballpark food for thousands at guaranteed rate field. Just don't look too deep in the comment section or you'll run into unscrupulous scrooges calling those utilizing these resources lazy and just looking for a handout. And now then, sir, about the uh, donation? Well, now, let's see. I know how to treat the poor. My taxes go to pay for the prisons and the poor houses. The homeless must go there. But some would rather die. If they'd rather die, then they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear. This is the door. You may use it. Me in the U.S. are still struggling to survive, while at the same time, companies such as Nextdoor, Block, and Walgreens lay off a significant amount of workers just before major holidays. It will be no surprise that food banks and other charities will see an uptick of people seeking assistance. In the season 2 episode of The Simpsons titled Bart vs. Thanksgiving, Bart wanders off to look for something to eat after refusing to apologize for his involvement in what happened before the meal. The early staff writers for The Simpsons graduated from colleges such as Harvard and Yale. Their depiction of the shelter and the unhoused reflect a background of privilege. Though their views were not uncommon at the time the episode was written, and they do point out some contradictions. I recognize that this is just a TV show and the image of the soup kitchen is shown as part of the plot, but the media we consume affects perceptions of marginalized groups. And why not ruin something in time for the holidays? Feel free to like, subscribe, ring the bell, and with Mothra the Bunny of Data Science, let's take a closer look at this early episode of The Simpsons. In this video, I will mostly use the word unhoused. There are various other terms, such as homeless, houseless, and housing deprived, used by their sources as a way to curtail bias and negative connotations. In the description are links for a couple different articles with further explanations of the differences in wording and why this has come about. From unhoused.org, quote, The label of homeless has derogatory connotations. It implies that one is less than, and it undermines self-esteem and progressive change. The use of the term unhoused instead has a profound personal impact upon those in insecure housing situations. It implies that there is a moral and social assumption that everyone should be housed in the first place, end quote. And it hurts to talk. So I'll just say one thing. You never do anything right. In Bart vs. Thanksgiving, I will say that the focus is more on the family dynamics during the holiday. I find Bart's journey to the rescue mission during the episode an interesting choice. Let's start at the beginning. The episode begins with Marge in the kitchen preparing the food and Homer engrossed in the football game on TV. 
At the same time, Lisa and Bart are fighting over glue that she needs in order to work on her centerpiece for the dining room table. She took my glue. Uh, it's not yours, Bart. This is family glue. Stop it, you two. This is Thanksgiving, so glue friendly or I'll take your glue away and then no one will have any glue to glue with. Dad, this isn't about glue. It's about territoriality. He only wants the glue because I'm using it. Oh, yeah? Prove it. Here. Hey, man, I don't want your stupid glue. After they are done with their scuffle, Lisa takes the glue and goes upstairs while Bart tries to help Marge in the kitchen. Can't I help you, Mom? Well, okay. Let's see. Can you do the cranberry sauce? Yeah. Where is it? The can is in the cupboard on the bottom shelf. Here? No, no, no. The other shelf. Oh, got it. Now what? Open the can. No problemo. Where's the can opener? It's in the second drawer from the right. No, 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 no. The other one. Oh, I got you. It's broken, Mom. Mom, it's broken. Mom, it's broken. Mom, it's broken. Mom, it's broken. Eventually, all the extended family gathers at the Simpson home for the meal, and it's time for Lisa to bring out the centerpiece. As the family is admiring her work, Bart intrudes in with the turkey, trying to take the same place as Lisa. Another fight starts, and Lisa's centerpiece ends up in the fireplace. Oh, yikes! What is that? It's the centerpiece, Bart. Well, it's taking a valuable real estate. <laughs> hey, Bart, stop it! Move it or lose it, toots. Mom! Now, just a minute. I'm sure there's room for both. <laughs> Marge tells Bart he needs to apologize. Instead, Bart chooses to start looking for his Thanksgiving meal elsewhere, which is how he ends up at the wrong side of the tracks at the rescue mission. Bart ends up on a news broadcast that the family sees on TV. Howl of the Unappreciated by Lisa Simpson. <clears throat> I saw the best meal. <gasps> it's Bart! Yo, is this? And how long have you been on the streets? Going on five years, Ken. Hmm. Son, your family may be watching. Is there anything you'd like to say to them? Yes, there is, Kent. Ha ha, I didn't apologize. Oh no, my sweet little Bart. By the end of the episode, Bart makes his way home, apologizes to Lisa, and the episode ends on the family eating at the table in the kitchen. Oh Lord, on this blessed day, we thank thee for giving our family one more crack at togetherness. Amen. Amen. Let's circle back to who is depicted in the shelter. Aside from a couple of possible exceptions, the majority of those shown are men. The clothes look more haphazard, dirty, and ill-fitting. The building is in disrepair and filthy. This is an early episode of The Simpsons, so the animation and detail on characters is more crude, which makes the details that are included more significant, since the early episodes are drawn by hand and required more effort. For example, the two homeless men that find Bart are both wearing layers of clothes and have five o'clock shadow. Depending on different factors, such as location, the percentage of men versus women varies. The statistics are mostly in binary terms, so that is what is used here. Location of Springfield is vague, so as far as whether or not this is accurate in the episode is unclear. Neither of the men have an accent that is stereotypically associated with low intelligence and don't appear to have an observable mental or physical disability. Their appearance suggests uncleanliness and is a stereotypical image of the quote hobo from early media. One of the most famous depictions being Charlie Chaplin. The term hobo conveys an image that being without a home or job is a choice or that they spend their money on vices such as alcohol. Those labeled as hobos were seen as people who traveled from place to place, not needing a permanent place to call home. This caricature of a hobo with his bindle is often used in early Simpsons and is usually played for laughs. However, in reality, people that are unhoused end up unhoused through factors they cannot control, the biggest being access to affordable housing. This episode of The Simpsons originally aired November 22, 1990. Access to affordable housing was an issue for lower-income households at that time. It wasn't at the level of the crisis in 2008, but lower-income households were still struggling. It didn't help that programs such as HUD received less government funds and had been part of a scandal involving shady contractors in the late 80s. About a mile away from the war fields, these CHA row houses have been sitting vacant and boarded up for years. They're part of two contracts to build or renovate 234 apartments scattered around the city, homes that poor people could be living in. Most of the apartments were never finished, and the $8 million budget is now gone. CHA records show that one reason why the money's gone is the agency paid for work that was not done. But not to worry, there was another scandal in 2013 with misappropriated funds. Congressman Al Green argues that sequestration has left HUD with fewer people to do oversight. But I don't think we can overlook the fact that HUD is understaffed. 
I don't think we can overlook the fact that sequestration has had an impact on HUD and is having an impact on many of HUD's programs. HUD's Inspector General, who uncovered the waste, fraud and questionable spending, says states and cities that receive the billions are also to blame for lax controls. The HUD program is a complex issue that I won't go into here. This is just to point out that being unhoused in the 1990s was not solely due to choice. In the episode, after the meal, the two men ask Bart if he has a place to sleep. You got some place to sleep tonight, Bart? Yeah, there's this family I kind of hang out with. Sounds pretty sweet. Yeah, I guess it is. Bart gives them the money from the plasma donation before running back home, after realizing where he lives isn't actually that bad. A little before this moment, after the rescue mission shuts down for the night, the camera pans to the various people as they leave and hunker down in their prospective spots for the evening. See you at Christmas. These people received a charitable meal, but a band-aid fix is not going to solve the issue of affordable housing. Unless there is food offered there on a regular basis, these people will continue to live with a high level of food insecurity since they can't guarantee when their next meal will be. When Bart makes his way to the wrong side of the tracks, he happens upon a plasma donation center that will give $12 to people who donate. I used a couple different inflation calculators to see what the cost today would be. Depending on the data used, that $12 today would be a whopping $26 to $28. Bart also gets a cookie though. Hey, you've got to be 18 to sell your blood. Let's see some ID. Here you go, dollface. Mm. Okay, Homer, just relax. Ow! Twelve bucks and a free cookie. What a country. Since this is in the, quote, bad part of town, it's not surprising that the person checking Bart's ID to see if he's 18 doesn't care or doesn't get paid enough to care. And looking at a couple different companies, an appointment to donate plasma varies wildly depending if there's a tier system, how often they go, and other factors. So in this episode, the amount given to donors is below market value, and since the location is in a shady part of town, it's not a stretch to assume that the person working is being paid less as well. According to the Jacobin article linked in the description, when one of the writers interviewed to be a phlebotomist to work undercover, in the interview the manager was more concerned with customer service skills than her healthcare background. From the Blood Money article also linked in the description, in 2021, four pharmaceutical companies operated 85.8% of plasma centers in the U.S. These are private companies, so it benefits them to try and pay workers as little as possible to increase profits, as well as set up plasma donation to be a complex system to pay out the least amount possible. Plasma is an important part of creating life-saving medications, but if we're going to compensate donors for the toll on their physical body, it should be a higher rate considering the amount of profits these companies gain. From the Jacobin article, quote, My insurance is paying $12,000 per dosage for this medicine. How much are the people supplying plasma getting? Payment for plasma donation given on a prepaid debit card varies from clinic to clinic, but averages out to $40 per visit. First-time donors can earn a higher rate to get them in the door, and returning donors can progressively earn more, provided they come consistently. Miss an appointment, and they have to start at the bottom again. But donate twice a week, or sign up for the right promotions and coupons, you could take home an extra $800 to 1200 each month." End quote. In a future video, I will be diving deeper into how industries such as plasma donation target and exploit poorer communities. For now, I just want to point out the low amount that Bart receives for donating and that The Simpsons pointed this out as far back as 1990. In the episode, the rescue mission is shown to be falling apart, there's clearly repairs needed, and it looks like the funding is not there. The necessary funds to cover rising expenses has not only increased the difficulty for the average person struggling to survive, but it's also made it more difficult for emergency food systems to meet the growing need. Part of the funding for the U.S. Department of Agriculture goes to emergency food system, which includes, quote, organizations such as food banks, soup kitchens, food pantries, and more support communities and ensure families can keep healthy food on the table. Investments focus on additional food purchases, improving infrastructure, supporting health and nutrition, bolstering local food systems, and promoting access and equity to continue to drive toward a stronger tomorrow, end quote. The USDA certainly isn't the only source of money for shelters and soup kitchens. There are also charities, religious organizations, and various other donors that contribute funds. At the end of the day, these funds are not always guaranteed to be provided at the same amounts or on a consistent basis. The increasing cost of expenses cuts down on the resources that can be provided within a community. In the NPR article linked below, Christopher Tan from the Food Bank of Southeastern Virginia explained that food donations are down, grocery stores have not been able to donate as much, 
and that disruptions in the food supply chain all impact their operations. In the episode, the people at the soup kitchen do not give any indication that they are employed. Most look indifferent at the situation. In reality, the number of people that are employed full-time who use food banks has continued to increase. Further in the NPR article, Fitzgerald from Feeding America says, quote, 30, 40 years ago, it was really an emergency food system for people who really had no other option, she says. Today, we're seeing a lot of folks that are budgeting in charitable food to their monthly budget. And when that is happening in this country, something is fundamentally wrong because a lot of these folks are working, end quote. 1990 is 33 years before 2023, so it's possible that the majority of those in the soup kitchen would have been in a more dire place. But let's look at the quality of the food. The Thanksgiving meal at the Simpson home is significantly better than at the rescue mission. We're not going to discuss the meal at Burns' house because he ordered it to be thrown away and was an example of how the rich waste resources. Mmm, delicious. Smithers, every year you outstrip yourself in succulents. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, would you like some candied yams? Oh, no, I couldn't eat another bite. Dispose of all this. Uh, I did, however, save room for your special pumpkin pie. The food bar gets at the soup kitchen is merely plopped on the plate. It doesn't look appetizing. When you are struggling to put food on the table, the amount of calories matters more than the quality, and that affects physical and mental health. Since many food banks depend on donations or have a tight budget, the quality and nutrition of the food they are able to provide is a mixed bag. As far as produce, there are several logistical issues since it needs to be out the door relatively fast before it goes bad. I'll link my video on access to fresh produce here for further info on that topic. From the Journal of Human Nutrition and Dietetics, quote, A high quality diet can be defined as aligning with national dietary recommendations, including the UK Eat Well Guide and the My Plate in the USA. Food insecurity is associated with poor dietary intake, including low fruit and vegetable and micronutrient consumption, as well as undernutrition and obesity. The latter relationship is supported by reliance on inexpensive, nutrient-poor, energy-dense food. Rising food costs, increasing price gaps between healthy and unhealthy foods, and reduced access to nutrient-dense foods in deprived areas further hinders dietary quality. Individuals who use food banks have inadequate energy, fruit and vegetable, dairy, and meat intake compared with national recommendations. In addition, their dietary quality is worse than the general population." End quote. Food quality is affected by a few different factors. Some food banks are able to work with local grocers to collect overstock, food that is nearing expiration, or food that does not meet a certain standard to sell but is still edible. They also rely on donations. Quote, food banks have largely defined their challenge as lack of food. In response, we have collected large quantities, including junk food, distributed it, and measure our success by pounds of output. While bellies have been filled, we have missed a real opportunity to improve the diet and health of those we serve. In fact, we unwittingly made people's health worse by failing to appreciate the power of food to prevent the troika of diet-related diseases plaguing low-income America, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity." End quote. Emergency food systems and related emergency programs are planned in a future video, but it's worth noting that those at the soup kitchen do not appear to be in stellar health. There are far more issues to discuss when it comes to the unhoused that deserve their own video planned for the future. I'll end this video with a look at Kent Brockman's news coverage. He begins with using incendiary language as a tactic to draw on the viewer. While at first it sounds like he's going in one direction, we see this. So every year on one lone conscience salving day, we toss these people a bone. As Brockman points out that you won't find a lazy person here or a Charlie Chaplin on the TV, Grandpa Simpson throws out this insult. A turkey bone. And that's supposed to make it all better. No, you won't find Freddy the Freeloader or Emmett Kelly or even Charlie Chaplin's beloved little tramp down here. Pompous blow-dried college boy! No. We don't get to hear the rest of the news story, but as Kent Brockman is in the van driving away from the rescue mission, he says this. Hey, thanks for your help, fellas. This reporter smells another local Emmy. Yeah, we're rooting for you, guy. Brockman exploited the poor as well. By using those in a dire situation as a way to appeal to people's emotions, it gives them a chance at an award. However, he did point out a real issue in that one meal is not going to solve the issue with lack of access to food and shelter and that these are not lazy people. We have data that shows providing affordable housing works, 
and helps alleviate other issues such as lowering health care costs and emergency room visits. So whether you celebrate Thanksgiving or not, as we approach the colder months, it's important to keep in mind that compassion, empathy, and understanding help facilitate a more cohesive and supportive community. Until next time. Remember, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. (laughs) Come on back and see me again for some more fun learning. And remember, treat other people the way you want to be treated. Okay? I've got to go now. So long.